Hello and welcome to Living Life, uh, April the 5th. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you join us and it's a pleasure for me to share the Word of God with you today. Uh, the passage we are looking at today is a continuation of 1 Samuel chapter 28. And we see in this chapter the final and ultimate downfall of King Saul. Saul, because of the terror that he felt in his heart after observing the Philistine army prepare for war, Saul so went to a spiritist to con conjure up the spirit of Samuel for counsel. We see the actions of a desperate man as he tries to hang on to his life and his kingdom as the noose closes in around his neck. He knows it's coming to an end. Our passage today is quite a frightening picture, a sobering passage as we see the wrath of God and the faithfulness of his judgment once again be proclaimed in Saul's life. So join with me as we look together at 1 Samuel 28, verse 15 to 25. 1 Samuel, chapter 28, verses 15 through 25. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, Why do you consult me, now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your maidservant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the women in urging him, and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. We begin in verse 15. Given an audience with his former mentor, Saul summarizes his situation shortly but also factually. He tells Samuel that the Philistines are threatening against him and that God has withdrawn from him. Verse 15. Saul's concluding explanation reveals his desperate and hopeless situation. Saul has nowhere else to turn. The writing is now on the wall and his heart is filled with terror. It is a hopeless condition. And so, I have called you to tell me what to do, Samuel, please. This matter-of-fact tone that Saul uses seems to imply that he and Samuel can simply just return to the early years of Saul's kingdom. Saul is hoping to turn back the clock to better days. It is as though he wants Samuel to forget all that has happened, as if he is saying, hey, 
please ignore this medium standing here and this illicit way that I've contacted you or your various condemnations of my character in the past or the way I've recklessly sought to kill David while neglecting the Philistine all these years. Please tell me what to do now. Saul's only concern is for his survival. It is not the honor of God or the will of God to be done for Israel and through Israel, but it is for his will to be done. If we're honest, isn't that how we often are in our life too? That we neglect our relationship with God, that we don't give a rip about God during the highs of our life. But as soon as we hit the wall, as soon as we are in our lows, then we want to rub that lamp. We say that prayer like God is some kind of magical genie to rescue us and to do our bidding. But Samuel's reply has no advice concerning the impending battle with the Philistines, verse 16 to 19. The message of the deceased Samuel was the same as the living Samuel. He simply reiterates the divine judgment against Saul announced when he was alive. Yahweh is no longer with Saul. Rather, he has been faithful to his word by becoming Saul's enemy. He has torn the kingdom from him and he has given it to a better man, David. As in chapter 15, all of this relates to Saul's failure to obey God and do what was pleasing in the eyes of God in the war against the Amalekites. Samuel tells Saul no more than he should already know. Verse 16, Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your en enemy? Though there is no advice concerning the Philistines, there is this. Verse 17, The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Samuel ignores the sin of necromancy and the presence of the medium. He makes no speeches rebuking Saul's shameful disregard for Yahweh's word. He speaks only of today and of tomorrow. The time of Saul's judgment has arrived. We see Saul's lack of food has variously been explained as a necessity of war because food was not easily accessible or as a result of his emotional state. But it seems probable that fasting was a requirement of a ritual involved in necromancy. He had gone without food all day and all night in preparation for his night visit to the medium at Endor. Now he is exhausted, finished. His kingdom is over and he himself is as good as dead. The woman feeds him his last meal, a banquet fit for a king who will not be king much longer. The Lord has spoken. You can really learn a lot about people by observing where they turn to in times of trouble. When David's life was in jeopardy, he turned first to Samuel, next to Jonathan, his friend, and then to Abimelech, the priest. David, we see, he consistently returns to the sources of his childhood faith. By contrast, Saul's visit to Endor in his darkest hour represents his final departure from faith in Yahweh. It is the nail on the coffin. It is the end for Saul. Any severe crisis, it heightens the sense of what one truly believes. And so Saul's trip to Endor belied the king's real commitments and revealed that his failure to nurture his relationship with God, the most important relationship during his lifetime, meant that he was unprepared for his life to end. Christians must attend to that most important of all relationships so that in our moment of crisis, which is inevitable because those days will come, we can face God with confidence and hope. How far has Saul fallen? How far 
has He come since He started as a man that pleased God with a humble and full spirit, doing God's will to someone now who doesn't even give a rip about God, who consorts happily with mediums and spiritists. We have come a long way from the depiction of soul as head and shoulders above the crowd, the man of God's own choosing in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 23, 24. Saul's life is a warning to all of us today of the slippery slope that is our faith and life, that we must all be vigilant in our faith because God's judgment is sincere. So brothers and sisters, let's continue to fix our eyes, to fix our gaze upon Christ, to not trust upon ourselves, to run away from our idols and to run to Christ today. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you so much that your love for us is sincere and it is never changing. That though we may run from you, Father God, that you are always there once again to receive us. So we come to you today in repentance, asking that you will forgive us of our idols. Lord, we want to fix our gaze upon you. We want to cultivate that relationship with you, Father God. So Lord, may you continue to work in us. Continue to work a good thing in us, Father God. Draw us closer in intimacy with you. That when the days of, of storms and waves come, when the days of persecution and confusion come, that Lord, we will be able to stand up straight. That we will be able to fix our gaze upon you and be held accountable by you. So we thank you so much once again for your word today. We thank you for the encouragement that it gives us, Father God. We ask by your spirit that you'll continue to lead us today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.